In Ephesians chapter 4, we come to a text in verses 1 to 3. And the focus of this sermon is from doctrine to duty. From doctrine to duty. There's an outline in your bulletin to be able to help you follow along. The persecuted church is not the only church that was uh, persecuted. This church here in Ephesus was also a persecuted church. The church that received the letter of Ephesians was another one of the persecuted churches. And the Apostle Paul was not just concerned about persecution from outside, he was also concerned about strife and trouble from inside. About the, not only from the troubles without, but also the sin within. And as the Apostle Paul begins to give this and write this letter to the church in Ephesus, when it becomes time to give exhortations, when it gives time to give exhortations, his first exhortation is to the importance of unity in the church. So when I was a pastor here, and during church membership interviews, one of the things I always tried to cover was the importance of in, endeavoring, striving to the work to the point of sweat for the unity in the church. So now I come back and visit, and what did the pastors ask me to talk about? But the same thing. <laughs> Your pastors asked me to talk about the same thing, the importance of church unity. Because Satan can work many ways. Satan can work on the outside and make in, uh, in working governments and make it officially an, uh, a crime to be a Christian, like in many churches and many of the people that we prayed for in the service. But he can also work inside the church and work to cause division or pride, arrogance in our own hearts. And so the Apostle Paul calls us to, to focus on this area now. Focus on unity in the church. And so we see here the fruits and attitudes. This morning, we'll cover verses, God willing, we'll, we'll look at Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 3, to cover some of the attitudes and fruits that, that produce unity. Tonight, in the evening service, we'll look at verses 4 to 6 of the same chapter. And we'll look at the foundation of unity, doctrine, doctrine. Both of these are key for unity. Both of these are key for unity. The attitudes that are in accordance with the gospel that we have in verses 1 to 3, attitudes and actions, and the doctrines are key for unity that we have in verses 4 to 6. We need both in order to produce a unity that God would want in the local church. In the outline, you'll see that we have various points they, that go in accordance with the verses that we have. Verse 1, we have live in light of your salvation. Live in light of your salvation. This is the introduction, the broad brush, the broad description of our text. And then we have particulars. Verses 2 and 3, we have humility, gentleness, patience, love, striving to maintain the unity. Particulars that come out of this foundation of living in light of your salvation. So let's take a few minutes now and remember the book of Ephesians and remember the, the context in order to apply verses 1 to 3 and understand verses 1 to 3. So when we look in Ephesians, open your Bibles now to look and, and we're going to breeze over Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. For many of you, you know Ephesians well. Some of you don't know it that, as well as others. So let's just remember some of the highlights here of this book. Because if we don't understand chapters 1, 2, and 3, you can't really understand the verses about unity that we have this morning. So let's take a few minutes and remember that. If I'm going to tell you a story of the 1700s and the colonial times with people with wigs and people with um, weird pipes and weird dresses, it's good to have the setting. It's good to have the setting and to explain a few things before I get into the particulars. And it's the same here. We're going back in time to a letter that was received by a persecuted church in, uh, in of Ephesus in an ancient time. And so we remember here, when we look over the Bible, we remember what, what the Apostle Paul spoke about. 
We remember he, he served in this church for some time, up to uh, three years, serving in this church, laboring in this church. And now he's writing this, this letter that's going to be received by another local church. And he is going to write about the glory of Jesus Christ. The glory of Jesus Christ manifested in a particular way. In the calling of his church, as his church is in union with Christ. And he's going to talk about particular blessings. He wants to talk and write about particular blessings. And in chapter 1, he writes about blessings of election. Blessings of the Father, blessings from the Son, blessings from the Spirit. Blessings that we have in Christ and only in Christ. And he talks about grace upon grace upon grace. Grace that we have to be chosen before the foundation of the world. Grace to be redeemed. We're not slaves to sin anymore. But in Christ, the Christian has freedom from slavery to sin. To obey Him and live for Him. We have an inheritance. We have the Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance. The first fruits. By the Spirit's work in us, we see we have a taste of something future to come. Blessings, blessings, blessings of grace. All these things are God-centered. Things that God did that we didn't do. And then we see in verses 15 to 23, we remember this hope and an inheritance and the great power that he manifested in this salvation. Not only in his humility in the work on the cross, but also his exaltation. And we remember that we receive blessings because of his great power sitting at the right hand of the Father. And then we look at chapter 2, and you all looked at chapter 2 in the past, not that long ago, thinking about how we were dead in sins. We had the inability and the corruption, the complete corruption. We were in a state unable to save ourselves, unable to see that we needed to be saved. Completely dead. Not partially dead. Not a little dead. But completely dead. But God, in verse 4, but God, what a great contrast. God made us alive. God made us alive completely by grace. He gave us a gift of faith, not of works. And this, what it produces, is good works. But note how the Apostle Paul doesn't explain the good works. He says we were made for good works. So then in chapter 2, verses 11 to 18... He now he speaks about, this is the little, uh, verses 11 to 18 are the, is the, the middle child, the forgotten part of Ephesians. Uh, lots of people remember verses 1 to 10 and total depravity, regeneration, being born again. By grace you're saved through the faith, but many people forget 11 to 18. We love this middle child, this the forgotten part of Ephesians that teaches us about reconciliation. What were we? We were also at war with God. Not just a problem inside, we had with our in ourselves, we had a, a greater problem. We had a problem of war with God outside of ourselves, a problem with him as our enemy. And him and by his work on the cross, he reconciled us together. And not only reconciled us with God by accomplishing a work outside of us, by the work on the cross, but he also reconciles us together. And so that we are reconciled, every tribe, tongue, and nation, and we have a unity and a peace that God accomplished outside of ourselves by, once again, union with Jesus Christ. Union with Jesus Christ is a theme uh, throughout Ephesians. And so we we remember that the Apostle Paul explains that the church is not just uh, like the temple, not just uh, a shadow of the things of the Old Testament, but what we have here in, the, in Christ's church is better. It's better. Better than the sacrificial system. Better than being a citizen of, of Israel. Better than being a Jew by birth. Now we're Jews in heart. Every one of us who is in Christ, in union with Christ, and we're better than the temple. You could build a temple over there in Israel, in Jerusalem, and what, but we have the reality here. 
we have the reality here. We are not just like a temple. We are the temple. And so we see here that the temple was just a shadow. And, we're, and the church is the reality that we have the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. And we see that we are for that, exist for that purpose in, the, in 2.22. In whom you are also being built together for, the, for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. The presence of God is in us. And the Apostle Paul speaks of what a blessing it is in chapter 3 to be in the ministry. To, ser- to be able to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. And then in, chap- in verses 14 to 21, which Jerome read, he exults in the exaltation. He has great joy in a, and expresses that joy in a prayer of, de- of praise describing what God has done in making us in union with Christ, describing the glory of Christ manifested as He saves the church, and then gives Him praise. At the end of chapter 3, now to Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Not only the power to save us, but the power to persevere us in the faith. To Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Just to read it, just to hear it by the ear, is to be brought to the heavenlies, right? You feel like you're hearing the Apostle Paul pray. Or you're with him as he's seeing a vision of heaven or something like that. And you say, yes, yes. And you, you're, you're, you're brought to see the, a piece of the glory of God. And then he brings us down to earth again. He brings us down to earth again. Martin Lloyd-Jones talked about the difficulty of going from 321 to 41. That, you like, that some uh, like to stay at the doctrine. And they like to think about the beauty and the, the, um, the order and the glory of thinking about God and His work and what He has done. And it's hard to come down, as it were, and Martin Lloyd-Jones uses the example of the transfiguration. And then it's hard for the disciples to see the transfiguration and then come down to the knit and gritty of going to work tomorrow. Others, when they come to verse 1, they say, yes, something simple. I understand this. Tell me something practical. Tell me something that I can apply and do. And what we want to see here is there's a need for both. There's a need for 321. There is an absolute need for chapters 1 to 3. And there's an absolute need for verse 1 and all of the rest of chapters 4, 5, and 6 of Ephesians. The practical application of the Word of God. And so we're at a crossroads here. We're at a great change in Ephesians. And we need to take a moment and stand and look back at where we were and look forward at the next valley. Because in order to understand and apply it rightly, we must appreciate, must value, must apply both. Some of us are prone to be attracted to to application or to doctrine. More than one or the other. Many of us, most of us, are attracted to one a little more than the other. Perhaps because one is easier for us. Perhaps it's easier for us not to work hard to understand systems of doctrine. And it's easier for us to understand. Or, or perhaps some of, for some of us, it's enjoyable thinking about the complexities and the beauty of doctrine. And in reality, we have to humble ourselves to apply it things in our lives. The truth is, both of us probably struggle with one or the other at different times. If we ha- have to admit, both, probably we're, we're guilty of both. We're guilty of both at various times. Maybe in family, or maybe at church, or maybe at work, or maybe we struggle with a different one. But in reality, if, we're, if we admit the truth, we can struggle with both at different times. So the Apostle Paul says to be a Christian is to have both. To be a Christian, is you, you need to understand both. Because if you don't struggle to, in, and work to understand the doctrine, 
you just want to get something practical, you will be prideful, you will rely on yourself, you will understand that God has given you the will to do, and that it's all from His grace. If you don't understand the doctrine of His grace, in com the complexity, and you won't work it hard to understand it, you will be arrogant, you won't be able to persevere, you won't have the hope of the doctrine. If you just want the doctrine, then you know that, that you are offense to Christ. That's not what he wants. He wants you, what, uh, what hypocrisy it is, to understand the beauty and the complexity and the glory of Christ and then not be changed by it. True Christianity, true Christianity is based on the reality, the reality of what Christ has done. Doctrine, the reality that exists that works itself out in a changed life. The reality of that doctrine is manifested by Christ actually changing real people in real time. Doctrine to duty. Indicative to imperative. Creed to conduct. Exposition to exhortation. This is Ephesians 4, 1. Let's drop into verse 1. Let's drop into verse 1 and let's take a look at the foundation. Let's take a look at the broad brush, the broad description of the broad introduction to the second half of Ephesians that describes the application. We read verse 1, live in light of your salvation, the title, live in light of your salvation. Says, Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. We can see the broad description here, right? Verse 1, live in light of your salvation. Live in light of your salvation. We will take it ver word by word. First we see I. I, therefore. The therefore is what is connecting us, what I described with the doctrine, the duty, the exhortation, the indicative, the imperative, the creed, the conduct, or the doctrine to duty. The therefore is what we described in the, in in the introduction. The I, we remember that Paul was a member of the persecuted church. I, the prisoner of the Lord. Paul wants to add some gravitas or some heavy um, impact to his words. And imagine Pastor, or Dr. Carl was, uh, was praying for the persecuted church. Now imagine we have a visitor from a persecuted church come up and preach. Imagine a missionary from a persecuted church or Pakistan. And he, says, and he describes how the pastor was killed and how the deacon had to become the pastor. And he describes a real story of, imagine the weight it would give to what he's saying. Well, that's what the Apostle Paul is doing here. He's writing the letter and he says, I, I the prisoner of the Lord, he can, as he moves to write, and he frees his elbow to write the letter, or as he moves to dictate the letter, either way it was, to someone who's writing for him, it's as if he can remember the chain that connects him to the Roman soldier as he's in house arrest in Rome. And he hears the chain as he, he says, and as he thinks and writes, right, I, th I, therefore, prisoner of the Lord, he wants them to hear the chain. In order to get the, the seriousness about what he's about to write, to say, listen up, listen up. I'm not a, pri Paul, I'm, I'm Paul, write it, and I'm not a prisoner of Caesar. I got Caesar's chain on me. I'm not a prisoner of Rome. What does he say? The prisoner of the Lord. He said, I'm Jesus' prisoner. There's a great beauty to him being a Calvinist. They're saying, it's not an accident I'm here. It's not an accident that I'm here uh, suffering in this way. And so you can see almost he smiles as he, as he tells or he writes this part of the letter. That I'm a prisoner of the Lord. I'm not a prisoner of Rome, nor any other of Satan or any other evil force. I'm a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as if he smiles to the guard, too. 
to communicate the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. Doctrine isn't just something um, he likes to think about, it's a reality. The reality that God and Christ exist and the, the universe exists for him. He's not concerned about self or writing about, um, sniffling about all his troubles and all the woe is me, all the troubles that come to me. No, he, he's, he's not talking about his, the, the horribleness of his, his circumstances, but now he's adding this to say, look at how I'm a prisoner of the Lord so that you listen to what I'm about to tell you. He's as a fatherly figure. He's saying, I'm just reminding you so you understand how important what I'm about to tell you. Because I'm about to tell you to do something that's very important. Okay, so we see, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, beseech you. So he's using an emotional word here. He's exhorting, encouraging. He wants to win them over. And then he says, he's saying, y'all, in good Georgia, uh, Georgia talk, as a good southerner, he's saying, he's, grouping, he's saying to you all, you all. And I mention that because maybe in your English Bible you, you can't see the you all. But in the original, it is a, the you is a you all, saying to all the church, I'm begging you, I'm urging you, I'm pleading with you about something. Like a fatherly figure, like a grandfatherly figure, saying, now listen to me, my son, listen to me. I don't bear these chains for nothing. So he says, what is he going to say? He says, I beseech you, I'm begging you, I'm begging you, listen to this. Walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. With such a few amount of words, he gives such a broad introduction. All of the rest of Ephesians can be put under this banner, under this description. I want you to live this way. I want you to live in a particular way. And he's using walk to describe the Christian life. I want you to live in a way, in a particular way. In a way that remembers the grace of God that you've been given. You know, remembering something of the gospel. Remembering that God saved you. Remembering that God gave you a new heart. Remember, you were an enemy and you were reconciled. Remember what God has done. Remember what God has done. And now I want you to live a certain way. Live in a way that goes with that. That goes with that. When you see walk worthy... Imagine if you were to, you were to, um, you know, one of the people who holds a sign on the side of the street, comes up to a light, pull off of I-4, pull up a light, and somebody says they, they hold up a sign to you. Imagine you give somebody like that, you say, okay, I'm going to give you a job in corporate America. Here's a job, and I'm going to give you some responsibility. It's not too complex for you, whatever the responsibility is. But this is an opportunity of a lifetime. An opportunity to go from zero to hero, just like that. Okay? And free. It's gratis. It's not for nothing. Nothing. For nothing. Okay? So how should they come to work the next day? Late? Not dressed up with a bad attitude? Where are the donuts? Where are the perks? Do I get health benefits? Complaining? Ah, oh, the traffic was so bad coming in. How, that's not walking worthy, right? That's not, that's, not the, that's not the attitude that should go with the blessing they've been given. It's just an illustration, right? It's just an illustration to, say, to get, help you to think about walk worthy. What does that mean? What does that mean for you now? You went from zero to hero if you're a Christian, if you're in Christ. Your zero was a negative. It wasn't just a zero. And your hero is, is, is gone in infinity because you are in union with Christ. So how should your life now be walking worthy? What does Christ deserve now? 
What attitude should you have? And so he gives this broad description. And so he says, walk worthy of the calling. And the calling is a, 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 another term used generally here to speak of salvation. Speaking of the effectual call, the work that God does alone in salvation. In the general call, as the gospel goes out, the Holy Spirit works in the, the effectual call. In the midst of that general call, He's the one who works by the Spirit to cause some deaf ears to hear and some blind eyes to see, some stony hearts to be taken out and the hearts of flesh to be put in. He does this miracle in the midst of the general call as the gospel call goes out. He does it irrevocably and in a holy way, in a way that brings hope. And then he says, the walk worthy of calling with which you were called to cause them to remember to cause them to remember. So now here's the general. Live in light of your salvation. Live in light of your salvation in a way that's worthy. Now the specific. So if we think about the foundation, now we go into the specifics of the building. Particular rooms, design, windows, decorations, the details of life. Another illustration, we could think of it like a tree. Think of it like a tree. You got a great big tree. It's got a big trunk on it. It's got big branches, very tall. Let's imagine it's like a um, hundred years old, super old, super big. And what does it have that you don't see? Yeah, big root system. If it's a big tree and it's real old, it, you know he's got a big root system to hold it. So the way that the Apostle Paul is talking here is to say the calling with which you were called is like the root system. It's impossible to have the fruits, to have the big branches, to have these things that you see. It's impossible to have them to have what you don't see. What you don't see is the work of grace, the salvation that God has done. But you can see the effects of it. Like when Jesus talked with Nicodemus about what it means to be born again. How do you know the work of the Spirit? Well, you see the effects of it, like the wind. And so, here, we're walking worthy of the calling of which you were called. Now, the Apostle Paul is going to, in verses 2 and 3, is going to explain branches. He's going to say, look at this big branch. Humility, lowliness. Look at this big branch. Gentleness. This other one, long-suffering. Bearing with one another in love. Big branches that all produce a fruit. Unity. Unity. They produce a fruit. What's the point of today and this sermon? We're, we're looking at doctrine to duty, how to have church unity. Doctrine to duty, how to have church unity. So we want that fruit. We want that fruit, and the Apostle Paul is saying, understand the fruit doesn't just pop out. Understand the fruit. You've got to understand how it, the root system The trunk, the big branches, are all producing the fruit, okay? So let's look at the other parts of the tree here. Let's look at the other parts of the tree that we have. The Apostle Paul gets into the details. In verse 2, if you're following along in the outline, we're moving from verse 1 to verse 2. With humility or lowliness, with all lowliness, it says in the New King James Version. Verse 2 says, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing within one another in love. We remember what we read in some of the calls to worship, like when Jerome was calling us to, to worship, remembering the gospel, remembering how Christ humbled himself, and now how, how he's in the exalted state as Lord of all. And we remember that what was connected with that is a call to humility. If the Savior of the world, if the King of the universe displays the unity beyond our understanding, beyond our imagination, what a little thing is for us to have humility, to have humil- humility. Let's consider the opposite. What's the opposite? Pride. Stuart Scott says, pride is a way of thinking about yourself. What is Pride. Stuart Scott says, is a way of thinking about yourself where you're the master and others are here to serve you. There's a self-exaltation. 
a desire to control things for your good. You ever walk in a room and think about yourself? You think about work and you think about yourself? Think about school tomorrow and you think about yourself? And how can I orchestrate everything to work out well for me? That's pride. That's the sin of Satan. That is completely in contradiction to what Christ has done. Remember the illustration about the homeless person who gets the job? In, the, the job? It's coming to work complaining. It's coming to work thinking about yourself. What's the op- so what's humility? Stuart Scott once again. The mentality of Christ. It's the way Christ thought. As a mind of a servant. Didn't Jesus say? And I said many times to you when I was here, even the Son of Man did not come to serve, but uh, not, to, not to come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. It's the mentality of Christ, Stuart Scott says, a focus on God and others, looking to exalt Christ. It's walking in the room and thinking about Christ and the desire to glorify and please God in all things for all the things he's given. Don't we remember that humility was one of the, is one of the primary fruits of conversion? Perhaps one of the first fruits. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The ones who are poor in spirit will see the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? To say I have great riches spiritually? To say I have a few riches spiritually? To say I have 1% of riches spiritually. Thank you, Christ, for the other 99%. Thank you for saving me and I'll add my other percent. No. Spiritual bankruptcy. Spiritual bankruptcy that 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 produces mourning over sin. So this humility is one of the first marks of conversion. How do you recognize the work of God? How do you recognize what cannot be seen by the work of the Spirit? How do you know if someone is born again? Well, one of the first things is they have a humility. I remember having a conversation with a, a brother, that, a family member that the Lord converted and in Guatemala. And I remember them calling me up, and I thought, oh, no, this is going to be a bad conversation. They're probably going to call me up and want to complain about something. They want to talk to me privately without anybody else there. And then I, I remember them talking to me and expecting to have another tough tough conversation, another family conversation where they were going to explain something bad or some other problem. And all they wanted to do, all the person did was talk about their, confess their sin. And I came back to Ashley, came to Lee and Gabby, and I remember remember thinking, maybe that so-and-so got converted. Because all they expressed was, it was the first time I ever talked with them of and the first time, and all they expressed was a humility. And so, what is walking worthy of the grace you've been given? This poor in spirit, lowliness. You think of others as better than yourself. You think of others better than yourself. Test yourself. Do you have many conflicts in your relationships? Do you have many conflicts? Are you known as someone who causes, who has a history of conflicts in this church or in your job or at home? Then you're prideful. Test yourself, whether you're a child, an adult, or someone who's uh, more advanced in years. Look at the history of your relationships. Work, home, children, wife, parents, evangelism. Jesus had many conflicts, but a prideful person is marked by sinful conflicts where they've not spoken with gentleness, not with pet patience, not had love, and that they have been the cause of many conflicts in part. Pride causes conflicts. Okay, so when we, we think about our tree, we got a tree, right? The calling is the roots. The calling is the roots. What's the trunk? The trunk of the tree is the humility. All these other now 
all of these other parts, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing with, with love, and to have the good fruit, the fruit we want, the fruit we want to get to, of unity, from doctrine to duty, how to have church unity. Well, how do we get there? We look at all of these other branches come out of the trunk. The humility produces effects in your mouth. The humility produces effects in your, with your hands, with your life. The humility produces a change in your attitude and your desire, what you're working towards. Some of these branches. Now the Apostle Paul describes some key branches, big branches. It's a big tree, right? Okay, look at this big branch. It's as big as Pastor Marcos. You know, it's like he's skinny, but um, right, but still big. Still big. <laughs> Gentleness. Gentleness is one of those branches. We move here from humility to gentleness. Gentleness here is not being impressed, overly impressed with your self-importance. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Didn't Jesus say, blessed are the meek? This is the same word. Meek is not weak, right? But in rather, it's the ability to suffer and do the right thing. There is actually a strength. There's a strength to receive an insult and respond, respond back with a kind word. There's a strength to that, that Christ had, and that Christians should have. A man, how do you know if you're, you're prideful or humble? Look at your, listen to your words. Listen to some of your words that come out of your mouth. The tongue. Are you quick with your words to impose your opinion on others? Do you insult others and then call it a joke? And tell them, I was just kidding. Do you say the truth unnecessarily in a hard way or at a bad time? You don't have the patience, you don't have the humility to wait. Or the humility to learn how to say it in a way that would be helpful and that they would receive it. Are you fit, quick to in, insist on your own rights? Are you ready to say the truth? But humble enough to say it when and how God wants, that's gentleness. That's gentleness. So we move in a fat, little faster pace now. We're moving one branch, gentleness. Now we move to another, patience or long-suffering. Patience or long-suffering. It says in verse 2, we're still in Ephesians 4, 2, where it says with long-suffering. With long-suffering. This is a state of being calm or without complaint and being able to suffer under a weight or under uh, when something makes you angry, when something bothers you or someone, we might better say, <laughs> will you be patient? What's the opposite? Not being willing to wait. Now, 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 now. I said now. Now. Vengeance, I'll make them pay. They will pay for being what they've done to me. This includes suffering or being or enduring for the sake of another. Big branch. Big branch. What's it connected to? A trunk. A trunk of what? Humility. Where'd that humility come from? The root system. The grace of God in salvation. If this reality that I'm in union with Christ, if I went from zero to hero, if I went from enemy to reconciled, if I went from dead to alive, if I've been re resurrected, then shouldn't I be humble? Shouldn't I control my mouth? Shouldn't I be patient, be willing to suffer? And now another big branch, another big branch in verse 2. Bearing with one another in love. Bearing with one another in love. Here this is kind of the same term that in Galatians 6, verses 1 to 2, where Paul, the Apostle Paul describes about how we need to uh, work, bear with one another, help someone who's continuing to go back to sin. Help them and encourage them. It's kind of like someone with a broken leg and you, you put their arm around your shoulders and you're going to help them to walk. And you don't 
think, oh, what am I doing here? I got my own burden. I got my own responsibilities. And this person should have learned to walk by now. It is their fault that they are in this condition because of their sin. They should be know better by now. Why am I having to help them now? And my own responsibilities are left behind. And you, to complain and think like this is not what Christ has called us to. It's not walking worthy of our calling. Instead, we're to bear with one another in love. What's the opposite of bearing with one another in love? Saying, no more. I'm not going to endure. Not, no more for me. I've had enough. No more forgiving. No more forgiving, no more patience, no more bearing, no more working. Notice another aspect, though, about this trunk. This trunk is a little different. You know how trees can grow, um, one branch can grow kind of funky or different or out of shape with the others? There's something different about this one. You need to take some initiative. You can't just sit back. Bearing with one another in love means you're not okay if you just say, um, if you're not serious about resolving conflict, if you're not taking the initiative. Doesn't the Apostle Paul say love is patient? Love is kind in 1 Corinthians 13? What is the kindness but taking that initiative? Okay, so we're called to have church unity. What, are we, what do we need? We need to understand this tree. To understand this tree, we need to understand how we need one key branch is you need to get up, get out of bed, get out of the house, get up and, and act and work, communicate, sit down and talk with someone face to face and have a conversation that you don't want to have. It would be so much easier just to sweep it under the rug, so much easier just to pretend like Everything will be fine if I do nothing. That's not love. You need to take the action. You need to take the inaction if you want to have church unity. If you're going to have unity with your brother, unity with your, and reconciliation with your brother is the appropriate fruit of being reconciled to Christ. It is walking worthy. You can't listen to your feelings. You can't just sit back. You have to fight your sinful feelings. You have to remember and act. Um, the grace that God has given, not only to give you life, but to give you the grace to persevere. You must ask God to give you the grace to pray for this person that you don't want to pray for or you only want to think bad of. You have to fight your own sinful feelings and trust Christ. Okay, we've spoken about the, the root, the trunk. The branches, humility, gentleness, patience, love. Now, now we get to the fruit. The fruit. Why do you have a lime tree? Why do you have a mango tree? Why do you have an orange tree? Why do you have a fruit tree? Well, let's get some fruit, right? Let's get some fruit. Yeah, Jerome knows about vegetables and fruit. He's got garden. If you've been to his house, you know about some of the fruits and vegetables he's, he's grown. Why do we have that? Let's get some fruit, right? Here it is. Here it is. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We've arrived at verse 3. Arrived at verse 3. Here's a strong word. Endeavoring. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This endeavoring is maintaining something. Keeping something. There's an intense effort here. Taking pains is what when endeavoring means. Eager to do something, motivated to do something, working to the point of sweat to do this. What is it? Keeping the unity. Keeping the unity. Notice how it says keeping something, not creating something. Isn't that great? Because it's the, um, we're keeping what the Spirit has given. The Spirit, when He saves... He gives us a unity. The unity amongst Christians is something God has given by His grace. Now we have the responsibility to maintain it. Remember our illustration of the guy who gets the job, right? You, you've been given it by grace. Now you, need to, now you need to work. You have a responsibility to work in it. Or if you've been given like um, washing something, 
yourself, a car, a house, cleaning a house. There needs to be a maintaining of something that God has given here. That's what God, what God is calling you to do. What's the opposite of verse 3? What's the opposite? Think with me now. Think with me now. Doing nothing. Doing nothing. Not just causing fights. That's like an extreme opposite. <laughs> not just, not just uh, being prideful and causing fights. You know what the disobedience and the opposite is? Doing nothing. And thinking you're good. I don't cause any fights. Yeah, but you don't communicate and you don't reach out and you don't pursue your brother and you're not there to be with your brother. You're not loving. You're not sacrificing. You're not willing to sacrifice. There's endeavoring means you've got to work. Endeavoring means you've got to, you've got to take it up and take the initiative. And you remember that it's all by the grace of God, by the Spirit, unity of the Spirit. And in the bond of peace. Here the Apostle Paul, remembering his chains once again, thinking, oh, we're not chained to a Roman guard. We're not chained, I'm not a prisoner of, I'm gladly chained to this work. I'm gladly in bonds to this work. I'm gladly chained together with you, brother, by the Spirit. And these attitudes and actions that he is calling us to. What a beautiful tree. This is our tree. As we come to a close, what have we seen here today? What have we seen here from today? A call from doctrine to duty, how to have church unity. A call from doctrine to duty, how to have church unity. We've seen living in light of your salvation. We've seen what the call, what we're, our responsibility to have a humility that is in accordance with the salvation we've been given. To have a gentleness, a patience, a love, a striving. So now let's move from the exposition to an application. So applications. What about you? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Are you here to watch a show? Or are you here to commune with the living God? Are you here... To mouth some words? To have friends? Or are you here? Are you here because your parents tell you you got to be here? Or are you here to hear from God and to commune with Him? What does He want from you? What does He want from you? If you're a pastor or a child, deacon, just a regular member, what does He want from you? What if you're unconverted here today? What does he want from you? If you're unconverted, you're not a Christian, what he wants from you is to be reconciled to you. To see the history of all the conflicts in your life. Why have you been unable to live without anger in your heart and a series of conflicts with your brother, your sister, your parents, your co-worker? Or maybe even somebody in this church. Why is it that your life is a trail of broken relationships? Why is it that you have to walk into a family gathering and things be awkward? Why is it? If your life is marked by this conflict, it's a sign of pride. It's a sign of not having humility of conversion. So what do you do? Do you try harder? Do you say, ah... I'm going to be a better person. Or do you say, I don't have the ability. I'm dead in my sins. Do you admit the seriousness and the depth of it? That's what Christ is calling you to do. That's what you, your responsibility is now today. Is to say, to cry out to God and to say, I am dead. I am dead and I don't have the ability to do what you want me to do, God. Save me. Give me that heart. Give me that heart. I have no fruit on my tree. Be willing to test yourself and ask yourself, examine yourself. If you're a Christian here, think about different areas in your life. Home. Cornerstone. Other believers. 
I'm focusing on the applications now because in, with other relationships with other Christians. Other Christians in your home, other Christians at church, other Christians perhaps at, at work or other churches. I'm focusing on this application because the, the context is on church unity. The context is Paul to the church, particularly calling them that the first application, if you understand the gospel, here's the first way to apply it in the local church, in the nitty-gritty, sweaty, stinky local church. And why do I use nitty-gritty, sweaty, stinky? Because it's hard to persevere in the local church. It's hard to persevere in the local church. In fact, let's say impossible. Impossible to persevere in the local church apart from the grace of God. Apart from the grace of God. So how is that grace manifested? Right now, in you humbling yourself to think about these different areas. Because you probably are more guilty in one of these areas than others. Have the humility to go home and ask your wife or ask your husband, which of these in verse 3 do I need to grow in? Humility, lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing with one another love, endeavoring to keep the unity. Maybe you'll hear something that is not exactly what you'd want to hear. Or maybe you'll hear a surprise. Will you have the humility to go and ask someone who knows you well? Will you have the humility to consider your work, these different spheres? Ask your small group leader. Ask a pastor. As a pastor, you can ask another pastor. Or as a missionary, you could ask another pastor. <laughs> have the humility to think about these areas. So what have we seen today? What have we seen today? Many practical things. Many things on, we've looked today and heard from the Apostle Paul from a, from a prison cell. And what is, he, what is on his heart? What does he want to communicate to this persecuted church? He doesn't speak about the persecution outside. He talks about, he begins by talking about the trouble inside. The importance of unity. So when we move from doctrine to duty, how to have church unity, and we think about how Christ wants us to live in light of our salvation. He wants us to live this way. He wants us to live with humility, lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing in one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. And we need to apply it now. We need to apply it in our homes. We need to apply it in our church. We need to apply it with Christians who are outside, whether at work or in other churches. Let's pray. Lord God in heaven, we pray to you now. We uh, lift up this text to you and we say, um, and we expose our hearts to you. We don't cross our arms in front of you. Uh, we want to humble ourselves and, and say, uh, pierce us. Pierce us. Um, show us the area. Um, we want to examine our hearts before you. And we want to give our lives to you. And say, please help us to change in the ways that you would want. Please help us to change in the ways we, you would want to grow. And to hear your call here. To walk worthy of the calling. Help us to do our part for church, church unity. Help us to communicate in those conversations that are difficult. Help us to communicate with gentleness. Help us to take the initiative to communicate. Help us to love when we don't have the love. Help us to, Lord, by your grace. We once again, we cry out to you. We didn't have the strength to save ourselves, and we don't have the strength to continue in this walk. And so we pray to you, please help us by your grace, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this day, and thank you for this uh, day to worship you. You're so good, Christ, to give us this call, to give us these words, to give us this uh, application. Thank you for your word. Amen.